Welcome to Young Farmers Club Akam. Here we undergo various activities, events and tasks all towards achieving the aim of seeking to increase the understanding of agriculture and foster a more realistic understanding of farming and its role in society. Moving on, to go into more depth of these activities and events required, our events deal with agricultural shows in which we participate in both Mombasa and Nairobi shows. We showcase and stand exhibits like science projects and farm products. We also judge livestock and farm produce. Rallies and quiz competitions. We compete with other schools in agricultural quizzes. Also, we do public speaking and debates. Care for the environment. We take part in tree planting activities as well as beach cleaning. Networking. We work closely with other schools in the community. Our activities deal with watering the plants in the shamba, planting new crops in the shamba, research on livestock and given crops in preparation for shows slash events, preparation of the shamba, and taking care of crops in the shamba. Moving on, there might be some preliminary information required while being in this club towards ensuring you can effectively participate and feel interconnected within the community. Firstly, you're expected to know how to plant various crops. Here is a small video based on how to plant vein crops. Like any plant, one of the key things you want to remember is not to plant it too deeply. Many people make that mistake and end up making a little bathtub in which water collects and the roots eventually rot because they're too wet. So if you've got a nice specimen here like this Rebecca triloba, you just want to give it a little wrap on the bottom and remove the root ball from the container. Now what you're going to see here with this one is like a lot of plants that come in containers, it's a little bit root bound here on the bottom and on the sides, meaning the roots have grown out, they've hit the edge of the pot and they've started to sort of collect there. And this is a bad thing because the, what we want the roots to do once we plant it is we want the roots to go out into the native soil. We don't want them to stay in this little root ball here. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to rough this up a little bit here. And again, don't be too gentle with it. You can do it with your hand or you can do it with the saw, you can do it with your pruners, whatever it takes to sort of rough that roof pattern up a little bit here. Again, it might seem like I'm being a little rough here, but the only thing you really need to be concerned about at this stage is don't let the roots dry out. If the roots dry out, they'll die. Otherwise, they'll be okay. So we've roughed that up a little bit. Now we've dug our hole, which is not too deep, and we're gonna just pop this baby in there. Now I can see that the top of the root ball is even with the surrounding soil or near enough, it's maybe a little bit high. A little bit high is not bad, it's better than low. So now we're going to backfill a little bit of the soil around there. Hal's going to put some water in the hole and then we'll finish it off later. What we're trying to do here is make sure that the soil that's in the root ball and the soil that's in your yard are well bonded so that there's no expansion and contraction creating a schism there the roots can't go across. So we're going to make those two soils mix together a little bit, go together, and then the roots are going to be able to easily move out into the yard where they need to be to collect enough water to live long term. Secondly, are expected to have some sort of knowledge about livestock and their quality of produce. This is a small video of the different ways to judge livestock. Hey there! Today we're going to talk a little bit about how to judge a class of livestock. We're going to start by judging cubs. I know it seems a little odd to judge cubs, but we have to learn how to judge anything. We have to learn how to compare the different qualities of those items and then rank them in a certain order. You can see that I've put numbers on my cups. One, two, three, and four. That's just to help me identify them and remember them as I talk about them. Now, before we can judge something, we have to figure out what are we judging them for? So to me, my number one characteristic in a cup is travel friendliness. I travel a lot. I like to have a drink while I travel and I'm just looking for a cup that I can take with me. My second characteristic in a cup that I appreciate is insulation. I like to have a hot beverage in the morning and a colder beverage in the afternoon, and I like to be able to have a cup that can do both. My third characteristic that I'm going to be evaluating these cups for is volume. 
Everybody likes to have a lot of a drink or a lot of coffee or a lot of a soft drink. So I want a cup that can really hold the drink that I choose. Lastly, we're gonna be judging these cups on handling. I need to be able to hold that cup in my hand, it needs to fit my hand, and I don't wanna to have to worry about it falling out. Now that we know our characteristics that we're looking for, we're gonna take each one of those and we're gonna rank the cups how we feel about them in those characteristics. In terms of travel friendliness, I'm gonna choose cup number one uh, to be first place in terms of travel friendliness. It has a lid, it has a, um, a cover that goes over it that I can open and close, and it looks like it would fit in the cup holder of my truck. Second place in terms of travel friendliness is gonna be cup number two. It also has a lid, it looks like it would fit in the, in the cup holder in my truck, and it, it would fit my hand pretty easily. Third place is gonna be cup number three. It fits in my hand, it would fit in my cup holder, and it is, it's just not as quite as good as cups number one and two, so it's gonna be in third place. Fourth place is gonna be this large mug. It does not look as travel friendly as the other three in the class. It's just, it's too big, it's not gonna fit in my cup holder. It does have a really nice handle on it, but it's just not gonna, just not gonna serve my purpose as far as a travel mug. So in terms of travel friendliness, I'm gonna rank these cups one, two, three, and four. Our next characteristic is insulation. And you can see these two cups are much more insulated than these two at the bottom. So we have an obvious top pair and an obvious bottom pair. In our top pair, I'm going to choose cup number one to be in first place again, because it is very well insulated. It's metal, it has a lid, it has a nice well sealed lid, it has a great cover on top, <clears throat> and it's got the, the double wall insulation that keeps hot things hot and cool things cool. Second place in terms of insulation, I'm gonna choose this clear mug. This mug also has two layers of insulation. It has a great lid. It's not as well sealed as the lid on cup number one. <clears throat> so I'm gonna put it in second place. I'm gonna choose cup number four in terms of insulation for third place because it is ceramic. Ceramic does tend to hold, it's like a regular coffee mug, <clears throat> does tend to hold heat and cool quite well. So in terms of insulation, cup number four is gonna be in third place. So that puts cup number three in fourth place. It's just made of silicone. It's not an insulated cup. It's not made to be insulated. So although it's a good cup, it's just not gonna place very well in terms of insulation compared to the other three in the class. Our next characteristic that we're gonna evaluate these cups on is volume. I like to have a lot of coffee in the mornings and a lot of a drink in the afternoons. So my uh, the largest cup here, so volume means large, so my largest cup is going to be cup number four. It is obviously the biggest of all those. It can fit a lot of coffee in it, and so it's going to be first place in terms of volume. Uh, cup number one is going to be my second place cup in terms of volume. It's about 20 ounces. Now, cups number two and three are kind of tied. Again, we have an obvious top pair and an obvious bottom pair in terms of our four cups. So these are both almost, uh, these are the same size in terms of ounces that they hold. So I'm just gonna pick one to be better than the other in terms of third or fourth place. So in terms of volume, I'm gonna choose, uh, I'm gonna rank these cups four, one, two, three. Our last characteristic is handling. <clears throat> so whenever you have a cup, you want to be able to handle it well. So cup number four is obviously gonna be our winner in terms of handling because it has a handle. It has a great sturdy handle. I can really get my hand on it and really hold on to this mug. Our next best handling cup is gonna be cup number three. Because it is silicone, I can really get my hand on it. It's kind of squishy, it's not gonna fall apart, but I can really hold on to it. It also kind of has a texture to it, so it's not gonna be slippy in my hand. For handling, we have an obvious bottom pair in cups number one and two. They're both kind of slick on the outside. I feel like I can hold on to this one a little bit more. It just fits my hand a little bit better. So I'm gonna rank these cups in terms of handling. Four, three, one, two. Now that we've ranked our cups and all of the characteristics that we like in a cup, we have to choose an overall winner. 
Typically, your overall winner is going to be the cup that placed first the most in each of the categories that you chose. However, we kind of had a tie. Cup number one placed first in two of our categories and cup number four placed first in volume and handling. So we have to really decide of the things that we are looking for in a cup. We said the two most important were travel friendly and insulated and our cup number one won those two categories. That means cup number one will be the overall winner of this class. Our second place winner is gonna be cup number two. Again, because it was second place in our most important categories of travel friendliness and insulation. Our third place overall winner is going to be cup number four. It placed first in two of our categories in terms of volume and handling, and it also is more insulated than cup number three. Our fourth place cup today is gonna to be cup number three. It is a great cup, however, it is not insulated. It's not quite as large as the other cups in the class, and it is just not gonna be as travel friendly as we would like to see. For this class of cups, I would rank these cups one, two, four, and three. Now that we know how to judge cups, we can apply what we've learned to any class of livestock. Whether this was sheep or hogs or cattle, we know that the first thing we need to do is figure out what four things are we looking for in those animals. Now we can take what we've learned from judging the cups and move over to market animals. When we judge market animals, our characteristics are first, muscle, second, frame, third, volume, and fourth, structural correctness. This is a class of four market hogs. Just like we did with the cups, you would take all of the characteristics and rank all four hogs amongst those characteristics. When we talk about market animals, we are interested in muscle first because that's what being a market animal is. The muscle is the meat that we're gonna eat. That's the marketable product and it's most important. Frame is second because the animal needs a big frame or a big skeleton in order to add all that muscle. It's important for the animal to be big enough to handle the muscle that we are desiring. Volume you can think of in regards to depth. So we want the animal to be very deep between their legs, under their belly. We want them to have a good depth of body. Structural correctness is important, but in a market animal we rank that last simply because a market animal is not designed to live for an extremely long period of time. We want them to have good straight legs so that they can have the muscle that they need in the right places, but if they have, you know, a crooked back leg or something like that, they're still a perfectly good market animal. The other type of class that you may find in a livestock judging contest are breeding animals. What you see here are heifers, which are the breeding stock for cattle. Our characteristics for breeding stock are in the exact opposite order that they were for market animals. We are first interested in structural correctness, then volume, then frame, and then muscle. An animal with good structural correctness is one that has straight legs, has a nice strong back, and just looks like they're very well put together. When we're talking about volume, we're talking about the thickness and the wideness of that heifer. She needs to be uh, voluminous because her job is to carry a calf and she just needs to have the, the depth of body that we need for her to be a good mama. For frame and muscle, we're referring to the actual size of the animal's frame. So the, the skeleton, the bone that they have in order to fill out that frame and add more to it. Muscle is important still in a bringing animal just because they need muscle to be able to, to be strong and to be able to last for a long time because as part of a breeding herd, they're expected to stay on the farm a long time. If you're interested in learning more about all of the terms that we use to talk about breeding animals and market animals and how to best judge them, here's a great resource from Pennsylvania State University. Good luck! Thirdly, you are expected to know the different agricultural products and how to measure their quality. This is a small video on how to measure the quality of crops.
Having high yield is awesome, but along with that, isn't it nice to have good test weight? How about just good overall quality, high protein? Well, today we want to talk about some of those grain quality factors in your crop. You know, when you talk to some of the highest yielding farmers around the world, one of the things they do focus on is grain quality. And I thought that was kind of an interesting discussion the first time I started having it, but then I hear it again and again and again. And I'm like, wait a second, I thought you were shooting for yield. And overwhelmingly, the message I got back was, well, we can't get those high yields without having exceptional grain quality too. And feeding that crop all the way through the season has been the key. And what we heard from many of these growers is the lesson we want to share with farmers that are struggling right now is don't give up on the crop so early. Now we hear it with soybeans a lot because yeah, soybeans can keep flowering late in the season. But you know, with corn, you may have all your kernels set on that ear, but you don't have the weight of those kernels set yet. You could still add some pounds. Fourthly, you need to know the different types of crops and how to take care of them. This is a small video of the different types of crops and how to take care of them. In this video, we will learn about types of crops. So, let's start our lesson by understanding what are crops. Have you seen a farm where on a wide area a large number of similar types of plants are grown? These plants are known as crops. So, crops are the similar type of plants grown on a large area for providing us with food. Farmers grow crops and earn money by selling them in the market. We buy these crops from the market to get food. Some examples of crops are wheat, rice, maize and also fruits and vegetables. Different crops are grown in different seasons. Based on the season in which they grow, crops are of two types, rubby crops and Kharif crops. Let's learn about them one by one. Rubby crops. Crops that are grown in winter season are known as rubby crops. These crops are sown just before winter arrives, that is in the month of November. They grow during winters and are ready to harvest by the month of March or April. Some examples of rubby crops are wheat, barley, gram and mustard. Now, let us learn about Kharif crops. Crops that are grown in monsoon season are known as Kharif crops. These crops are sown with the beginning of the first rain, that is in the month of June or July. They grow during monsoon season as they need plenty of water to grow. They are ready to harvest around the festival of Diwali, that is by the month of October or November. Some examples of Kharif crops are rice, maize, millet and soybean. Fifthly, it is needed to know the different tasks, activities and events in the club which were all shown in this video. Due to this, welcome back to Young Farmers Club and hope you enjoy your time.